Hey Internet, this is part three of my talk, Snakes, Ladders, and Closure, the Mechanics of Sequential Art. There's actually going to be four parts, I think, at this point. Uh, the last part, uh, part two, I talked about transitions and picking your moments, and now we're going to talk about flow. Don't forget there is an uncut version of this on Patreon, so go to patreon.com slash salgood to watch it in full without any breaks. Or just find the other pieces here on YouTube in the public feed. And don't forget to subscribe so you get all my videos when they come out fresh. You'll find full credits for all the sources and references in my videos here in the doobly doo too, by the way. Here's a comic page from Captain America 111. Tomorrow You Live, Tonight I Die. 1969, written by Stan Lee, art by Jim Stranko and Joe Sinat. I think it's Sinat? 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 Probably Sinat. It's an interesting example. It's, it's widely looked at as a, a really kind of fascinating comics page. It's almost a non sequitur. It breaks a lot of layout rules. And the, so what we're looking at now is, is, is talking about flow and page design. There, notice there's color coding. There are greenish yellow panels. There are red, rose, pink panels, and there are blue panels. And the last panel is naturalistically colored, so it kind of could belong to any of them almost. Uh, we're kind of left to feel almost like it's a lighting thing. So we see that there are penny arcade with lots of neon lights. And then depending on how you read this, there's multiple options given. And it's actually designed to be intentionally a little bit confusing. He wants you to wander. Sterenko is trying to make you lost in the space. So a lot of this is aspect to aspect. It's about making you drift and then the layout is intentionally jarring, confusing and provides multiple reading interpretations. You can go diagonally straight through Penny Arcade, Stan Lee, Record Your Voice, Newsweek, Target, 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 Tomorrow You Live and Die and read it very linearly in a straight down line because those panels kind of lock together in a, in a diagonal. Uh, there are multiple inter readings and so this inspired uh, someone to do a study. I believe his name is Neil Cohen. And he found several different, and described several different uh, uh, kinds of stacking and, and flow relationships and panel arrangements. And this is a, a diagram that illustrates them all. So there's a pure grid layout. That's just basically when you have panels stacked in a straight grid. It's one of the most common comic layouts because it's simple, it's clear, and it's clear, easy to read. Uh, it relies on for west left to right, down, left to right, down, left to right, clear reading style, no confusion about where to go next. Uh, you can do horizontal staggering without interfering with that too much. Uh, so one panel being off to the side a little bit, we still go left to right, down, left to right, not a problem. Uh, drop down to the next row, we see overlap, not a problem. You've got your big panel, and then to the right, an, a panel overlaps onto it. It kind of steps in the moment. We have a, Instead of having a gutter, we have a panel lop, stop, dropping on top of a panel, so it feels like a very abrupt transition, a very short or, or even the absence of a, a moment of pause, like someone's interrupting. Uh, then we have a big separation. So one thing that does is clearly s break apart those two uh, pairs. There's a long column and two panels. And you, it's quite clear that you're not supposed to read long column, two panels quickly. You're supposed to read long column, spatial pause, two panels. And then you would go down the two panels. Uh, vertical staggering is a little more interesting. So where you stagger and how you stagger can have uh, a big effect on where you go. But generally speaking, uh, we would read a panel on the left, panel on the right to the bleed. And then what happens? We would probably go down to panel on the bottom, panel on the left, but maybe not. So this is something that's referred to as blocking. When you have that space there, that's in the, those, the, the, the horizontal gutter doesn't line up you can create a moment of blocking, which we see at the bo bottom blockage. And so some readers might go down from left panel top to second left panel just below it, and then to the, the right panel, the bleed, and the panel. So you gotta be careful with that. Uh, then there's this whole roll, cinematic large wide window with an inset. And that's an interesting, it's kind of like overlap. So you have a large moment, and then an inset kind of cut away the, the double panel border there suggests a bit of a pause of time between the inset and the larger context, but it's still a moment stepping on a moment. And then we have blockage. And blockage is one of the most interesting ones that came out of this study that Neil did. Uh, it's one of the examples of something that, like if you look at Jessica Abel and Matt Main's book, they have a whole couple pages about this kind of panel layout where you have two and one on the right. And they recommend you just don't do it. 
because they feel that it re confuses readers. So do you go down or do you go over? Do you read left, right, bottom, left? You could, but do you read left, down, and then to the right? Some people do, and it was always a debate, which would you do? So I think there are ways to do either way, and at another time I will talk about that. But Neil Cohen did made this part of his study. So the next thing we're gonna see here, on the left are a bunch of different empty panel layouts. The one in the bottom corner, the L, is actually that uh, tonight I live, tomorrow you, or sorry, tomorrow you live, tonight I die page. The rest are all just made up. They're imaginary comic pages. Uh, they had never had drawings in them. What he did is he created all of them and he showed them to a large number of people, half of whom were comics readers and half of whom were so comics literate and the non-comics literate. And he just asked them, like, number these in the order you would read them. How would you read these? So A, the grid was a no-brainer. There was no surprises there. People go left to right, down, left to right, down, left to right. Straightforward. Very intuitive. If this was uh, in Hebrew or Japanese, we would switch it. We'd go right to left, down, right to left, down, right to left. Um, but basically the, the language norms of the culture you're in will inform the way you read this page. It's a sort of default mode. It's one of the most popular ways of laying out a page. This is a, a, a six panel grid, nine panel grids, and 16 panel grids, and four panel grids are all very, very popular because they're, when they're evenly laid out like this, there's no confusion about what to do. And when you, when you have time constraints and you don't want to get too fancy, I fully recommend it. I use these a lot. They're beautiful. You'll see me using one uh, like this, a, a nine panel grid shortly. Um, the next one's kind of interesting. So you have this diagonal cut and that top corner becomes what's called an entry point. So you notice in the bottom index there, so the orange circle is an entry point. And there's another one there. There's actually four panel layouts that have entry points. And entry points are interesting because they're not where they traditionally are, and it creates a, a question mark about what order you read panels in. So with the entry points on B, do you read the top right or the bottom left first? And then how do you get your reader? If you go bottom left, my inclination would be to go to bottom left, top right, then how do we get them down to the second row? So that's about how you design your the art in the panel. Uh, D is really interesting. So we have a, a bleed panel, uh, a, a panel below it, and then a top right and a bottom left on either side of it, bookending it. This could get really messy. <laughs> this is a page design that has lots of potential for trouble. You could there's totally ways of making that work, but it's all about how you you use your lettering, which I'll show you in a minute. There's ways of using your lettering to lead the eye, and it's about where the art is and how it directs your eye. Uh, uh, but you are going to be deeply re re dependent on other elements to make the flow clear because the panel layout doesn't intrinsically lend to clarity at all. It's confusing. Um, G and H are less troubling because they have a, they don't have that secondary sub panel happening off of the bleed panel. So you've got the three slices or the big curve and then sort of the cutaway bit of curve for G. I think, again, it's about the art. Uh, that inset panel complicates things a little bit, but I think you could go easily with um, something that's uh, lower panel, inset. See, actually, that inset panel really complicates things. I wouldn't have that inset panel on G. So the, the first or lower right panel of the top row has an inset cutout that matches the lower row. That, I think, is deadly. That's a problem. But, and I'm, it's funny because they don't have any marks on it. I wonder what they got for the order reading. Uh, but if it wasn't there, then it would be potentially bottom right, middle, top left is the easiest reading. And then you can hijack that using different tricks to change it up. But because where that inset is and because it matches the panel below it in the next row, we've got issues. Uh, H is probably one of the easier to use ones. People will start most likely that big scoop panel and then drop down and read the next two as a row on their own that just have sort of a, a panel in, uh, encroaching on their space. Um, the interesting thing here and what the rest of this page is all about is how blockage works. So blockage is the red circles and then there's something he calls Z blockage, Neil's, Neil's findings, he described Z blockage with a red square uh, just outline. So red, a Z blockage is when you have a tall column and two panels next to it and blockage is when you have two panels and then on the right a tall column that goes along both of them. And what he found was when you have a tall column 
on the right and two panels equally sized to it stacked next to it, 90%, 91% drop down and read the, the panel below before going to the right. Only 9% went that way. So that suggests that the, the implied reading flow is actually strongly in favor of dropping down, which is why he calls a blockage. You don't jump and go in the direction you should linguistically, which is left to right. You first drop down. So it suggests that height hierarchy is very powerful and can hijack left to right hierarchy. So our left to right hierarchy is our, our dominant way of reading, but stacking order and height can easily hijack that, which is the best why, like, uh, in panel page C, uh, the top pair C, so it's called separation, that purple circle, I think people would read the two drop down and then read the two drop down because that separation works like blockage. It creates a strong spacing and now we have two columns. So that's what we're seeing with the blockage effect. Now it's noticeable the way you've got these variants all across the bottom left, or sorry, bottom right here. When the, the, the tall column is a little shorter and only goes half the way down the second column, the statistics start changing, right? And then when you get to that last example in the far right, notice that 34% go, still go down and 66% go over this way. Do you know why? This is my theory about why. I would love to, Neil Cohen to, to verify this for me someday. Uh, if you have that wide vertical gutter as it is in this illustration and narrow horizontal gutters between them there is a stronger association it's like it's like the separation effect in the diagram it's not as big as the separation effect but it's still wider than the horizontal gutters so to cancel this out and get people to properly read uh to more like 100 percent going across and then down uh you would need that that vertical gutter to be the same width as the horizontal gutters. And then I think you would get much closer to 100% going to the right and then down. And then because we have blockage here, continuing down and then back to the right again. So there's some more stats in the panel here, up at the screen here. You can freeze if you want to check it out. Go check out uh, Visual Language Lab uh, for more of Neil Cohen's work. He's done a lot of papers on the subject of sequential art. It's probably, I think, one of the only uh, people applying a scientific method to the mechanics of sequential art. So uh, I mentioned lettering having a huge impact on it. So one of the universal rules of comics lettering is that because, so again, Western comics, this is switched for uh, uh, Hebrew and Japanese amongst other languages. Anything where you read from the right to left, this it would be reversed. Uh, and if you read vertically, then that's the dominant thing. But here, where we read left to right in the West for English and French and most uh, Western languages, and so that means that the first character that talks should be on the left, and their balloon needs to be over them on the left. So A and then B. Yes! Below that, notice we have blockage. I want you to go f down first. You have the tails crossing. A and then B. No. So A is actually the person on the right, and B is the person on the left, and their tails cross. It's confusing. It's visually confusing. And, and you read the text and the people in, in the wrong orders. What you can do is have them staggering like I see in the tall column. All right, So you can have A, B, C, D. And the way I've got this, I'm still following the person on the left gets to talk first, but technically I could get away using uh, uh, vertical hierarchy by having B on top. I would also probably tuck it a little further over on top. So, and then it would drop down and connect to D by a, a connecting tail the way A and C are connected. And then you could have the person on the right talk first because ver vertical hierarchy would work in their favor. That could work. But that's pretty much the only way you can successfully do that. Um, otherwise, if you ha don't get the person on the left talking first, you're going to have problems with the way it reads. This is not going to read well. Um, now, when we talked about uh, the... So again, we're on, on, the, on the left here, we have an example of, of blockage. Two panels stacked, and then one tall panel. And, and notice that because the gutters are all very even, it's very clear you go down and then you read the tall panel. Um, I can hijack this and change it. I could get you to go from the top left corner to the big tall panel and back down to the top right, or bottom right panel. Uh, so on the side we have here some layouts from Todd Klein. Uh, the f two top ones are examples of what he called confusing lettering blue placements. And I think they're like designed to really effectively illustrate how not to do this. <laughs> so 
Notice in the first one, I'm going to focus on that one. Uh, we have one, two, and then go to the panel at the bottom of the page for three. Then we jump to the top, four, five, six, and then notice where seven is. And then eight, and then nine, and nine kind of touches seven. And then ten, and then over again to eleven, and twelve, and thirteen, and then back into fourteen. So that bounces around a lot. Notice that seven and eight are reversed to intuitive reading order. So you can do that, but not like that. That's not going to work, because what would have happened is that people would have gone four, five, six, eight, seven, nine, ten, eleven. Especially because nine touches seven. That that contact, that's a bridging effect. That's what I call it. And you can use bridging effectively. It can work for you. You're going to see it work for you in the next in the, in the good example. But if you don't use it well, it's going to enforce the negative here. That you feel like seven and nine is the way it's supposed to be read. But then when you read the dialogue and the sequence of actions, it's going to be confusing. So below that, we see the way to fix the problem in the first example. Uh, Todd Klein did this one as well. You've got one, two, three, all nice and clustered together. There's a proximity effect between three and four that make it very easy. There's what I call an eye line jump right across to where four is, five, and then see how six is placed. That's bridging. Seven is bridging. It's pretty obvious, right, what bridging is. It creates a literal visual bridge between the panels where you want to go next. Eight, nine, ten. A little bit of almost sort of, it's not quite making it, but 10 and 11 kind of clip the edges a bit and suggest bridging 12, 13, 14. Uh, the other panel, page next to it, you can check above how it's laid out and it's just as messy, but notice how flowy the B example for that one. Now these are called challenging layouts by Todd. He had some less challenging but clear layouts, but I think these are just excellent layouts. The, they, they use really effective bridging techniques and flow. Um, the line that he's drawing between the panels, I, I think about that too, and I call it the eye line. And I, there are two eye lines, the eye line created by the flow of the balloons, and there's an eye line created by the flow within the art of the panels. Um, and sometimes they can be the same, but you usually want them to be complementary and kind of crisscrossing. And I use the eye line for the word balloons uh, colliding with the eye line in the art as a tool. So when I want the text to be less confrontational, more casual, I don't want them to collide. I, I, what I do is I say, I'll have the eye line for the art, sort of the line where you look through the art, and I'll have the word balloons hanging near it, but just off of it. So you never encounter a word balloon directly on the eye line of the art. They're just nearby. Um, but when I want someone to fight and I have really confrontation language happening, then I'll put that word balloon right in the middle of the eye line because you can avoid it and it's just, it's, it's there, it's confrontational. So we'll see some examples of that later on. So here we have page flow, visual flow, uh, done traditional style with grids. On the left, we're looking at a classic Kirby Captain America page. This one's been used to demonstrate flow because it's, it's an excellent example. We have a, a, a fight scene. It's a very standard uh, nine panel grid, but we have an immense amount of energy and speed and flow in it because of the posing and the way the action suggests the where you should move and creates the eye line that I was talking about. So first shot, character is swinging back to kick and gets punched in the face by Captain America. Notice the movement of the swing blends nicely into the Captain America's punch, which is left to right to the next panel. And then he kicks again or punches again and he's swinging back. So we go back down. Our villain swipes legs out from Captain America and he's mo his legs moving in the direction that he wants us to read left to right. Captain Karate chops him, left to right. Punches him, left to right. Notice the leg leaning back and how that nicely points to the direction you want to go to the next panel. Captain America gives him a, a, a blow coming down, a blow coming up, and with the up movement, we are now in a overhead bird's eye view. So we have a, a, the choreography of the fighting is choreographing where he wants you to look and how he wants your eye to travel. And the figures and their shapes flow together and read into each other. I've done very straight arrows, but you could actually do these sinuous arrows that sort of echo the movements of the punches and help kind of double down on the sense of the way you're supposed to flow through the page. So even though it's a, a straight grid, this page has a lot of fluid energy about it, and it helps give it that rapid feeling. And these are all action action randoms, by the way. So here we got a, a Mutt and Jeff comic strip. A uh, guy comes into the editor's office. He's angry about a restaurant review. And he says, how dare you suggest that I don't eat in my own restaurants? And the editor gets up and trying to be sort of 
uh, diplomatic and 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 uh, placate him. Says, "I'm sorry, you took offense, and you know why don't we have a, a, a discuss it over drinks? Uh, let's go to uh, uh, your establishment to chat about it." And then the angry chef says, "No, no, I know a better place." <laughs> so there's your punchline. He's angry about never getting his restaurant. And he doesn't want to take us to this restaurant. So the physical flow here echoes the emotional social dynamic. So the guy rushes in. He's very vertical. Our editor is in a placating, leaning mood, so we're moving into the vertical form. Then they both flow in and then flip around as the punchline is delivered. Uh, action scene. Uh, this is a, an engine room in a ship. And the, uh, the first mate, I think it is. So that's easy. That's just easy in company, right? And uh, so easy is doing some stuff there. And the first mate comes in, is drunk, and thinks someone's up to no good. And he attacks easy and punches him and then jumps in his face. Okay, so look at the flow. The all of the leading edges of the perspective shot in the first focusing on easy also draw you into the moment, and then the eye line of of the figure leads to the face of the drunken, confused. I think he's the first mate, uh, and then uh, who's completely mad attacks him, and the kind of weird, awkward posing of the figures helps give you this. See that staggery line. This, this jumpy kind of action, it feels clumsy because the guy's drunk, right? Uh, and then you get the feet coming down at the face. So it's, it's much more clunky than the Kirby page, but you see a clear sense of flow as the action accelerates. We get sucked in, pause on the face, da 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 dum boom. So again, rhythms. That's the end of part three for now. Part four, we're gonna look at atypical flow We'll see what Snakes and Ladders has to do with all of this finally. And Rolling Transitions, the eighth kind of transition I mentioned in part two. Remember that you can see the full unbroken version of this video on Patreon at patreon.com slash salgood, where you can also pledge to help me make more comics and for a little more to become a student patron and get feedback and support in your own efforts as a comic artist or general artist. Uh, subscribe to get all my videos as they come out. And if you look in the WDU, you'll find links to all the source material that comes up in these clips. See you in the next clip.